Welcome to Shop Talk, presented by Show Chic, where they always put the rider in first place. In Florida, that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm here with my horses, my clients. And uh, but not everybody is is showing as much and at, as at the level that I'm doing it, or some of my students are. Um, but I think the show preparation is, regardless of what level you're doing, it's pretty much always the same. So I want to share a few things with you. I'm gonna put my somebody was asking about my age. My age is so that I can wear glasses without being ashamed. <laughs> okay, and you can look that up online. I am. 42. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, when we're thinking about um, showing and getting ready, preparing for the shows, there's really two, um, I think, two aspects that, are, that we need to think about. One is the physical and the other one is the men mental uh, preparation. The physical preparation um, it's clear. I mean, that's basically the technical part. It's learn how to ride. Know what you're doing on the horse. Understand how to ride your horse forward, stop him, turn. I think those are the essentials, right? <laughs> as long as you can go, stop, and turn, you're in good shape. Um, and if you can do it when you want or where you want, even better. So <coughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the mental part, because um, I think the mental part really starts way before we go to the show that's coming up next weekend. I think the, the mental preparation starts really with goal setting. Um, and what is goal setting? I mean, you you're decide that you, that you want to ride and you decide that you want to take that one step further, not just trail riding. On a <coughs> sunny afternoon, you really want to compete and then what level do you want to compete? Um, do you want to go to national shows, regional shows, international shows? Um, for me, really, when I was, was a kid, when I started riding and when showing became an interesting uh, sort of venue for me, there were a lot of kids in our barn where I rode, uh, sort of similar to what, what Lenden does, a similar program, you know, typical uh, German riding club with tons of kids, and I think everybody wanted to go to the Olympics <laughs> that year, <laughs> and that year. Um, and um, so we all had that dream, but it was not, I mean, I'm, for me personally, I've certainly always had that dream of competing in international competitions, um, going to Europe, going to some of the big CDIs, uh, doing like the World Cup, and, and, and I'm, so I've, I made it to the Olympics. I haven't ridden in the World Championships yet, so that's still on my bucket list. So working, working on that. But um, so goal setting. For goal setting, you also need to decide what kind of horse you, you need. Do you need a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old? What can you afford? So there's many, many aspects about before you can really say, okay, next week I want to go to a horse show um, that you want to take care of. Um, when it comes to um, purchasing a horse and, and setting the goal of what level you want to ride and where you want to take this, um, I think it's probably always a good idea to find someone you can talk to. Don't do this on your own. Um, talk to the person you want to train with because that is probably the closest relationship with a person um, where you can get good uh, information from. That person will say, um, look, you're 75 years old, it may be a little bit too late to make it to the <laughs> Olympics, but how about the annual show, you know, as a goal? So I think you have to come up with goals that are realistic and um, then remember many things. Um, if you want to compete at any level, you are an athlete. So you have to treat your body like you are an athlete. That means that you um, 
since you're now riding a lot and uh, if you're getting if you're doing anything with horses if you do it right you have to do it every day uh, you can't put the horse in the box can't put them away and walk away for a week they, you have to handle them all the time and you have to do it for yourself too you need to ride all the time I mean when I go, go away for the week and I teach a lot of seminars why well, I don't ride so Fridays is basically my short day I ride a couple of horses that I'm sitting on a plane for several hours I teach the weekend come home Sunday night um, <coughs> when I ride Mondays I'm stiff I mean it's like and you know the horses fe must feel exactly the same way just imagine um, I'm not a fan of giving horses a day off and I'm a fan of giving horses a light day but I'm not a fan of giving horses a day off because a day off means if you ride on, my, on let's just say you ride on Saturday is your last day you rode your horse at 9 o'clock in the morning then you put him away Sunday is off Sunday at 9 o'clock is 24 hours then you come back Monday same time now you're looking at 40, 48 hours uh, 48 hours in that however 12 by 12 or whatever your, your stall is it must be pretty boring the horses no wonder they go crazy <coughs> on Mondays when we ride them again so the horses need to work all the time or have exercise all the time and so do you and part of that exercise is uh, what is very important especially when you want to compete um, is cross training so and cross training you can hit the gym I mean there's a million gyms around or you can do it at home you don't have to really do huge workouts uh, to get yourself in shape but when we ride as much as we do in that one discipline, we really work one side of our body excessively and we're neglecting other muscles. So when you're cross training, you wanna make sure that you work other muscles. So, um, and when you're younger, you, you, you can probably deal with, with it or your body can deal with it and, and you don't feel the little aches that we feel when we get a little bit, <coughs> a little bit uh, older. And uh, but I can tell you right now, I mean, that if I don't work out, I can feel that my back gets tight um, and just the typical stuff, you know, that, that, that you feel. And so I make a point of going <coughs> to the gym twice a week, which isn't enough. Um, sometimes I try three times, but it's just then it's time consuming and it's that one hour that you, that you, have, to, and you have to go there. It, takes, it all takes up time. We have lives. You know, we have families, we have jobs. Um, I'm very lucky that I'm a professional rider so I ride all day and um, but still there's there's commitments that you have obligations you know with your clients you have to go to dinner and all all this life life happens but you have to make time for um, the things that you need to do in order to be successful when you compete so <coughs> working out is one part um, eating is is the the other thing um and i'm not sure if i'm the right one to talk about because i can eat like a bag of uh, gummy bears and be <laughs> just fine and better two two bags actually so there are there are some you guys know okay there are some foods that you should eat you know and some foods that you should try to stay away from treat your body like you are an athlete whether you ride first level or whether you ride grand prix and you're looking at the olympics all the same um, so let me talk a little bit more about the technical part of riding um, now that we've we know our goals and oh, one more thing about the goals um, I think it's also a mindset um, that you have and I'm not saying right or wrong I'm just saying what works for me and it doesn't work for everybody I love to compete and I'm very competitive, I love to win. And I'm not happy if I'm second. Um, but I'm not riding because I wanna win. I'm not riding because I want to go to the Olympics. Um, I'm riding because I like to ride. I enjoy riding, I enjoy riding, well, the more Grand Prix horses the better, but I enjoy riding the green ones too because it's, it's, it's I like it, it's, it's a challenge for me to, um, get in sync with a horse and teach them new things and um, if I have a horse that is maybe a little stiff and I can make it around a circle three times and the horse wasn't stiff three times then I'm, it's, I'm thrilled I'm very happy I would say I can be as happy and as um, satisfied about that as I am if I win a Grand Prix or I get a really good score and, or a judge comes and says you had a really good test 
So it's kind of like you know the, the, the same level of satisfaction. So that is something that works for me and um, always has worked very well for me. There are a couple of things as far as the mental preparation goes um, that I've learned over the years and I want to share that with you. Uh, but let me first get back to the more technical part. Um, and from sort of being driven and wanting to go out and wanting to do rather third level than second level and rather pre St. George than fourth level. Um, y you have to push yourself, you have to push your horse, but at the same time I think it's important that you have, that you have to know that you own the level. So if you go out and you compete and you want to do well, don't show at a level where, where it's too much for you or for your horse. You know, so I, uh, I like to, um, so I showed a, a third level horse uh, for the first time th last weekend. And uh, it's a seven year old horse and great horse, super mover, all that kind of stuff. And he pretty much can do all, he, so it's a change, it's a new thing, okay. One side the change he can do, the other side is, let's just say 50% there. Okay, and depending on the warm up, if I rig it just right, then I may have a good shot of 75% uh, chance of making the, the change or not. So um, I got the one side really good and I didn't get the other side. But I kind of was prepared and I, I, I knew that that was a small hole, but it's not, I would not have gone into that class knowing that my changes are not, there's only two changes in that test. Knowing that I have no changes, I would never go. I would, I, I would never take this horse in there. Um, maybe mostly out of fear that my colleagues would watch and go like, what's Abeling doing? That horse has no <laughs> change. What's he doing in third level? So know what you can do and know what your horse can do. Push yourself, but don't push your st yourself to a place um, that is impossible for you to do. Um, so the one thing that I really like to do um, and that is, it does not come, or it never has come natural for me is test riding at home. Um, I kind of grew up in a, I guess, riding environment where you rode and, and as an apprentice I had a bunch of Grand Prix horses that I could practice with every day and you had your pattern, you went, you know, you trot work, the half passes and then you did Pierre Passage and you did your canner work, you were four, three, twos, once, had a mistake, once again, had another mistake, once again, don't you know what you're doing? So you had a pattern, but we never really rode tests because the, the gentleman that I rode with, he, we always said he had a golden butt. Um, he just could do it. I mean, it was, he didn't have to think about it, he just did, and it was always good. Well, Joe Average is not in that situation. You know, you have to kind of practice your tests and you have to kind of know your layout and all that kind of stuff. So it was a little bit hard for me when um, people started telling me, why don't you practice at home, ride your tests? I'm like, I'll do that at the horse show. And um, that was a, was a, hi honey, that was actually you that <laughs> started that with me. My wife was always like, why do you never ride your tests at home? It's like, because I don't, I ride them already at the show. I don't want the horses to know the test because then they anticipate and all that kind of stuff. Baloney. If your horse, if your horse is through, they have to go through the test. Do they, after a while, know the test? Yes. But, but you still have to practice patterns. So what I do typically is I write parts of the test, a part of the test every day. So the trot work, after my warm up, I go through the trot work of, let's just say in this case, the last week, the third level three. So I do the trot work and then at the walk, I take a walk break and I just walk. And then I may do the trot work again. Um, so I ride it maybe two times. So I know where the holes are in the te or going to be in the test. Um, and then once a week, at least once a week during showtime, I ride the entire test. Um, I find it very helpful to be videotaped and then um, I try to make the time to watch the video right after my ride myself. Um, <coughs> I think people have said that I'm very critical on my, my students. I'm probably more critical on myself. If I see this and go like, oh my gosh, this is really not show worthy yet. 
Um, so I do that right after I, I write my tests at home. The other thing that I find extremely helpful is um, call a judge, a judge that you think is a good judge and have them come over and you ride, get a couple of riders together, make a mini clinic, you know, one morning, five riders, four riders or what, and ride the test that you're going to show in two weeks. <coughs> and have that judge judge the test and say, you know, I like this, I didn't like that, and go back and do this medium trot one more time. Um, it's too fast or your horse is too low or this, that, the other thing. And again, videotape that and then look at it afterwards. Maybe the judge can hang out and, and can say, see this right there? This is what I, what I see and I don't like and that I really like. So make sure you do it that way. So those are things that I do routinely, especially doing show season. Maybe in an off season, not so much. But right now I have every week a judge come and um, judge me on a couple of horses that I, that I compete. Um, also with some of my, my students. <coughs> And so that is one of the things. Uh, another thing that I haven't done in a while, but that I did before, I think I did that before the Olympics. Um, there were a couple of mental th uh, uh, things that I, uh, that I did um, <coughs> where I actually dressed up in show clothes, like put the hat on, put the coat on, braid the horse, pretend you're at a horse. You, cannot, you can never recreate a horse show. Horses are always different at a horse show, we know that. I mean, if you have 80% of the focus of your horse when you go to a horse show, that's pretty darn good. Um, but you can kind of mimic some things. You can maybe go next door. Or <coughs> in my case, we have a very big arena, so we have one dressage court set up, and next, next to it is a sort of a large, uh, a little bit bigger than a dressage court. So I warm up there, and then I go into the actual arena. So it's to the horse like, okay, we're going from one place to another. Yeah, get dressed up. And I think putting on the show clothes does mentally something to all of us, where you go all of a sudden it's like, you know, deer in the headlight effect, and you get nervous. Um, and I do want to talk about the, the mental things that you can do when you get nervous. Um, when I have my clinic where I invite judges uh, to judge me. I try to not only write the test. So wh wh when you test, when you write a test, write through the test. If you make a mistake, don't do a volt and say, I need to do this again. If the mistake happened, go on and figure out what do I have to do after I make a mistake? What do I have to do if not everything goes perfect? Now, if your horse breaks in the medium trot, we all, you go, darn, you know, you turn around, you do another one. It breaks again, you do another one. Well, you can't do that at a horse show. You've got to practice exactly the way you do it at a horse show. So write the test, no interruptions, no walk breaks, oh, I need air. Um, you know, my horse is pulling so much, let me, give me five more minutes, meaning also time your warm up. So on every horse, I have a certain warm up routine that I do. Typically, it's right around 30 minutes. Some are less, some are more. And I know exactly how many um, minutes I have to walk before I start warming up. I know exactly how long of posting trot I do, how many rounds, how many minutes. Um, and I have a little person in my ear all the time, go like, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So I always know exactly where I'm at. Um, and then I know I have to do my counter work. I have, so I have a set number of minutes. That's my warm up. If I'm not ready at show day, too damn bad. It's like, make the best of it. But that's then next show you give yourself five more minutes or five minutes less. Um, but practice that at home. Time the warm-up. Go through a preset warm-up routine that you know works. Not one time it's like, mm, I'll do the counter work now. No, no, I'll do the trot work now. I mean, you always have to be ready to do a compromise. But kind of stick to what typically works at home and then write your test at home and have it judged and look at it afterwards. So those are things where um, I guess I'm really strict about. So going back a little bit to the mental part, um, I'm lucky I have a couple of grooms. I don't have to clean my horses myself at the horse show, which is really great. So the test is at 10, so say the warm-up is at 9.30. Or let's just say warm-up is at 9, 9.25.
So at 9, and I tell them at 9.25, I want to get on. That means at 9.25, if I'm not on, I'm stressing out um, by one minute. It's like I get really antsy, and I, <coughs> I really don't like that. And then sometimes I'm probably not all that nice to uh, the people that work to me. But, that, but that's one of those things. It's like where my routine gets, gets kind of broken. It's like I know, ooh, now I'm in not a good place. Um, so timing is really, but I, I think by now everybody knows that it works for me. It's like, okay, he wants his horse at 9.26, you have it ready at 9.24, so just in case. And if you have it ready too early, then that's not good either. <laughs> Jan is not happy. So anyway, so, but there is a timing that you want to figure out when you're at the shows, and that timing you have to learn at home. You have to practice that at home, and you have to you have to be a little gutsy and say, okay, after 25 minutes, I am riding my test. My horse doesn't feel right, I'm still riding my test. Your horse makes mistakes, and you finish your test. And then you watch your video, and you say, oh, okay, this really didn't look all that bad. It felt, felt like crap, but it you know, doesn't look so bad. But here were some things that I didn't like. How, what can I do differently next time? I need an extra five minutes. I need an extra 10 minutes. Or I wish I could have walked because I was out of breath. My horse is great, but I was out of breath. And um, so those are things that you, where you can really prepare yourself. Um, hold on. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, we had to eat right. <laughs> okay. Um, Quickly about the cross training. Um, it's time consuming, but it doesn't have to be time consuming. It, 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 I think it's more an effort to make the effort. You know, I mean, you can do this uh, if you spend five minutes in the morning to just stretching. I think stretching is probably one of the most important things you can do. Um, and then if you want to take it further, then you can go and, and work with the trainer, go to the gym or do whatever you want to do. Have in your basement, have a, you know, do some cardio, have a bicycle or, a, you know, whatever you want to do. So there's many things you can, you can do. Um, I don't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger because then my, my tailcoat doesn't fit anymore, you know. <laughs> and so you have to kind of probably do it with a trainer that kind of guides you through it just the way you do your riding. It's the same thing. Um, if you want to compete, kids don't do that alone at home. You've got to have someone that watches you. I have someone who watches me all the time. And people say, well, you've been at the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. and I had somebody there too. <coughs> so you need an eye on the ground because it looks different than it feels. And um, as a rider, we always go by feel. Um, I think you've all when you compete, come out of your class, and you've all had that sensation of, man, that was a really good ride, or oh, that really sucked. And then you get your score, and you thought you had a really good ride, and they're like, what's wrong with that judge? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, because we look at it from a very different angle than the judges. We feel. We feel with our hands. We feel with our butt. When the horse is tight, all of a sudden you can't sit the trot. You can't really can't sit the medium trot. And you know, oh, that's not good. Um, but so we judge our ride really by what we feel. And then once you become a more advanced rider, and, and you, I think then you can kind of look and go like, well, you know, I have problems here, I have problems there. But you don't see yourself riding. I mean, the judge doesn't feel, they just see. And they just say, they give you a score for how it looks like. And how they think, if it looks like that, most likely this feels good and is right, looks right. Or I don't, they don't really care how it feels. They only care how it looks like. It's a big difference. And they give you also a score for every single movement that you do. So every long side, every diagonal has a, an, an up and down transition also. We forget about that mostly. We come out, we, we give ourselves always one score. Oh, that should at least be a 75%. It's like, well, your halt wasn't square, so there you start out with a four. You know, then he tripped a little bit in the first medium trot. Um, so that was probably not more than a five. How do you come up with your 75, you know? But, wait, but it felt so good, you know? And so those are things that you, that you have to remember. And also learn from 
your mistakes that you've made in the show by reading the, the um, score sheet, but by reading it right. And by I always read the score, the, when I read the score sheet, I don't read the, the points that I got on the bottom. I always hope that they give me like one good comment uh, or whatever, not good or bad, whatever it is. But I try to, that's always the first thing I read, the, the general impression. Because the general impression tells me how the overall ride looked to the onlooker, to the judge. Um, if I see um, um, should be should be rounder, um, and then you get you know for submission all that kind of stuff you get hammered. Um, so that kind of tells me okay throughout my horse was not really round enough and looked stiff. So tomorrow I can go and fix that because I mean there's exercises that I can do with my horse to take care of that um, or too low, too low, too low, pole should be higher, pole should be higher, more engagement. Okay, w there's exercises I can, I can do to fix that. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can learn from reading your, your score sheet uh, by reading the general impression. Um, and and most, most all judges put something down there and sometimes you don't get it and that makes me really mad always when, when there's no comment at the end because I want a comment of, I don't want to know how good I was, I want to know what went wrong, what did you not like because those are the things I can make better, hopefully. Um, <coughs> there are some things where you should, and you should also, also always do that with your trainer because your trainer can put a, the whole thing into perspective, sort of be the bridge between the judge and you, saying, well, you know, the judge saw, thought that, but I know how your horse feels, and I know how difficult your horse could be. He was much better, but the scores don't show the improvement yet, because the judge doesn't know and doesn't care how bad last week was. He just cares what he sees today, that minute. Um, so again, this is something where you need um, the input from your trainer to guide you through it. The, the, the mental aspect again. Um, so the, the one thing that I always did, well, sometimes you, some of the lower uh, classes you can, you can read the test. Um, when I show a lot of horses, um, I have people read it to me, but I don't really like that. Um, I just like to know the tests um, because I think that I'm better prepared. Um, if I if I really know the test, so I used to be like five minutes before my class do this it takes about what 15 seconds and my whole test was was done. And um, did you visualize your test? Yeah. No, that has nothing to do with with visualizing your test. So visualizing your test is a is a technique that I find extremely helpful. It's extremely difficult to do it right. And, you know, I never really did that until, oh, probably, I don't know, a couple of years before the Olympics, um, I started doing that. Um, I did the, uh, yeah, Walter the end. So that was my, and I did that several times during the day. Um, now, again, I have a routine um, where, I picture myself riding the test and I have a couple of videos basically of myself that I play in my, in my head. Um, <coughs> some people can do like a bird's eye view so you see yourself and doing the test um, or you can see basically how it looks like when you're actually sitting on the horse so you see the arena as the arena moves and turns as you're going through the, so there's two different things. I, I can do both, not everybody can, and um, sometimes I do the bird's eye view and sometimes I ju do just the ride. Um, so when I do that, I start with my entry outside. I know exactly where I start outside the ring before I go down the center line. I know exactly the spot. You hear the bell or the whistle and then I go to a certain spot. Some horses, so if you, if you enter in the, in the canner, some horses enter easier from the left, some from the right. So I know exactly, okay, I have to go over there, turn around, 
be in a specific spot. And then I pick up the canner and I feel that the horse is a little bit too high, I would go back to walk. I'd probably make a little volte. You have, what, 45 seconds, I think. Um, so there is time to do that. There's not a lot of time, but there is time. Um, so that basically my test starts out there and I, then I go down the center line, I know exactly how many steps it takes to get to X and halt. So let's say it's 12 steps. By nine, I start collecting. 10, 11, 12 is halt. So if I'm, a if I'm a half a meter off, I'm a half a meter off, who cares? Nobody can see it anyway. I don't think anybody cares. But so again, that's, you know, I count my steps and I know exactly where I'm at. And I ride that in my mind. Um, then I have a salute and I salute in my mind. It takes the time that it takes to do the salute. It takes the time to get from A down the center line to X. So it's not just one second and you're done. It takes the whatever it is, five seconds and then it's a halt. So by the time I'm done visualizing riding my test in my mind, it takes the actual time that it takes to ride the test. That's hard. Visualize step for stride. Step for, for step. Stride. stride for stride. Stride for stride. So, and that's not just a pattern. I'm not just riding the pattern. I'm riding the test. I'm doing every half halt on a good day, on, a, on, my, on my perfect day. Yeah, if I have problems with my one tempies, that day I have no problems with my one. They all, they all work, okay? I deal with the, with the crap that happens later. But it's like my perfect test, okay? Um, and then, sometimes, um, I in the past have asked my, either my son or, or a client or my wife or something to, to be there. And um, as I'm trying to focus, um, make a mess of it. Go like, hey, <coughs> what time is it? Hey, watch the, the video. So distractions. As I'm going through my test, I deal with distractions. People are coming up, you know, pushing me on the shoulder like, hey, Jan, hey, what's going on? Ah, oh, ooh, this is the most important oil show. Oh, this is really dip. Oh, this is not going well. <laughs> so I do that too. And um, I had a, had a really great um, psych coach um, that, that taught me these things. And I remember the, um, my first session that I had with him. And he, sa he was talking about visualization. And, and, and I said, this. And he goes like, we have work to do here. <laughs> so he taught me how to do that. And then he said, oh, and it was, we were getting ready. I think we were getting ready for a World Cup or something, I don't know, something, some quote unquote big show. And he said, oh, well, so what's, what's happening? Yeah, World Cup, what do you do? I said, well, you know, I have a couple of shows here. Let's start with some little shows, nothing, nothing important, just, you know, local little thing, uh, just to kind of get the horse out, just kind of see what's going on. And then three weeks later, I have a, have a CDI. But it's not so important because it's the first ho show of the year. The judges are easy, you know. It's just again, it's just I just want to kind of get my feet wet, you know. And then, but the next show has to be on, and then we have one more, and then one more. But then, and then it's to Europe, and then it's the big stuff, you know. I mean, it has to work, and then eventually, hopefully, it's going to be World Cup. And he said, um, "That's all bull." He goes, "That first show that you go to is as important as your World Cup." So you have to, and again, this is not something that works for everybody, but it really works for me. Um, when you ride, or when I ride, I try to have every ride be my best ride, whether it's at home, or whether it's at some tiny little show, or whether it's at the, at the Olympics. I do the same thing. I try to get the best out of my horse every time. So then I sort of have a bar and I have something that I know I can do and I know my horse can do and that really works for me. Uh, I know that um, some of the people that I have been on the team with doesn't work for them. They want to think that at the Olympics it's like this is when I really need to go and it works for them. So I think you just have to kind of figure out what works for me or what works for you. What works for me um, is, like I say, I mean, it's like every day is the same. It's just another sandbox, whether there's 10,000 people watching you and the TV is there or grandma is there and is watching you. It's all the same. You go out and you do your best. Um, and so that is one thing that has really, really worked for me. And, you know, um, there, was, um, there was one international show in my, sort of my earlier 
career with, with my horse Rafaka. Uh, well, we had done a World Cup, and then it was, I think it was our second World Cup was in Vegas. And <coughs> something went wrong. I went, had a great warm up. And I mean, the weeks leading up to it, that horse was on fire. She was great. Um, had a good warm up. I think Monica Terroresco was going before me. And I had seen her on the warm up. I'm like, I can beat this. Which is already a big mistake. <laughs> don't, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't dwell and, you know, just do tunnel vision. Do your thing. It's like you're in that box and you're, but you learn. So anyway, I thought I could, could beat Monica De Teodorescu. Um, and I came down the chute into the thing and it just didn't happen for me at all. It's, I don't know what, what uh, something. So the horse saw something and she wouldn't even go to the judges down there. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. I was, was um, lucky to finish my class um, and unfortunately did not move on into the freestyle, which is the World Cup is all about freestyle, you know, so you'd basically qualify, get a qualifying score in the Grand Prix to move on into the freestyle. And it was just short of it. And I'm like, oh man. So, and so after that experience, I said, okay, a couple of things I have to change because if that happens, what do I do? Because um, I mean, I was talking about frazzled and talk about nerves. So, and that's when I started, uh, um, working with this, this uh, gentleman um, who was really helpful. And one of the other things that he said is like, well, what about breathing? Do you breathe? I'm like, I'm alive, I breathe. <laughs> and so, no, he goes, no. Again, we have work to do. <coughs> Try to make an effort. When you ride around the ring, every time you go through a corner, take a really deep breath because breathing is very relaxing. So if you get nervous, and I think we all get nervous, at least butterflies, you know, butterflies is good, but nervous to the point where you're sick, not so good. So what can you do um, to take care of your nervousness? Breathing is, is really good. So there's breathing exercises that you can do. And to this day, I'm like, really? I mean, this is like so, this is from me coming from this German background, you know, it's yeah. like, what do you mean you can't ride the horse? You just shut up and ride to like <laughs> breathing. So this was really, really a big stretch for me. Um, but um, I tell you what, it really, really works. And if you can make it around the arena three times and you knowingly take a deep breath in and out through every single corner, that's four times each time. If by, but by the time you get to the third round and you've done every single corner, Give me a call, then, because that is difficult. <laughs> After the second corner, I already <laughs> forgot. You know, it's like, oh, forgot to breathe, you know. <laughs> Ken said you need to breathe. So, um, same thing back to visualizing. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a good helping tool just to learn your pattern, um, to learn what you're trying to do and figure out what you're trying to do. Um, it is, I find it extremely calming. Um, so the breathing I also do when I'm, when I'm in writing my, my test visualizing, it's like, so it, it's really, it's literally doing the whole thing. Try to do it real time. So it takes you whatever the test is, six minutes, seven minutes, whatnot. Um, I still, I can't get over the breathing still. I mean, if I, if I think about it to this day, I'll never forget the first time he, he told me, are you breathing? I'm like, dude, I'm alive, I'm alive so I must be breathing. And so those things were, were really, really helpful. Um, I stick to a routine. It's, it's like, you know, I think sticking to a routine that works for you and, and uh, I think pretty much all the friends that I have that, that compete at any level, um, everybody has a routine. For me, it, it really starts several weeks before the test, where I ride the test so many times a week, where I put parts of the test together, and then I get closer to the, to the horse show, I put the test more and more together. And then the day of the show, from the moment where I get up, there are certain things that I do at a certain time. Um, so <coughs> being in the zone is, is part of it. 
um, during that time I visualize and it's again it's something that you that you have to practice but I get to the place where when I go through my test mentally I sit somewhere in some corner or, or somewhere and somebody can walk up to me and, and talk to me I have no idea that you're there and I <coughs> I never thought that that was possible especially for me because I'm a scattered brain um, uh, so visualizing helps to focus um, it is a tremendous tool to focus and and so sometimes at night if I'm when I go to bed you know you turn the TV off and I said I'm just gonna go through my test now and so I'm just <coughs> lying in bed and I'm going through my test and all of a sudden I'm stuck somewhere and typically at the third or fourth movement and I'm thinking about the movie that I was just watching it's yeah. like ah, oh, you're yeah. like gosh you know lost your focus so um, this gentleman that was my psych coach, uh, his name was Ken Revisa. He was working with a lot of riders, but really um, a lot of baseball players, uh, figure skaters. He had one uh, figure sk skating pair that before the Olympics, they, when they visualized, they, were to the se they, <coughs> they timed it and they were to the second, did their routine. The day after the Olympics, they tried to do it, they couldn't do it anymore. So I find it very interesting because it goes to show you how much you can focus, but you have to practice it. And it can be extremely helpful about how difficult it is. And then, so when the sort of the stress of the competition is done, you start all over. And um, sometimes people ask me, well, how was it at the Olympics? What well, was cool? Well, how was your ride? I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I really, I don't know. I don't remember anything of my ride, which is a shame. I wish I would, but, and I'm not saying this to make this like some cool f statement. That's, I have zero recollection. I remember um, getting ready and, and, and saying, okay, it's your turn. And I remember riding, there was like a, this thing that you had to ride through in, the, in this huge arena. And I had a plan, like I have my plan. I wanted to make it around the arena, but it was so, the arena was so far away. So I wasn't even half there, they rang the bell. I'm like, what the hell? It's like, I, what, what about riding around the arena? So now you're down to your 45 seconds. And so that's the first time all of a sudden somebody really yanks your chain, right? And so that's the last thing I remember. The horse's ears and the bell and that was it. And then zero, zero recollection. I have to watch it on, on YouTube or wherever to kind of to see the ride. And then I remember, so after the salute, when I was, was leaving the arena going like, it's over. And so it, it was, I find it's a really interesting experience um, because I've never had that before ever in none of the big or small competitions that I've done. Um, so, but I really was working on the visualization and um, on focusing and could I do this right now? No, no, I'd have to practice for several weeks to do that. But that is something that I think, I think that is probably the, the single most important thing that you can do, um, working on visualizing your text, learning, working on how to focus. And also, of course, knowing how to ride. I mean, you've got to know how to ride your horse forward. You've got to know <laughs> how to do the movements that you're asked to do in your test, right? I mean, if you don't know how to do a half pass, maybe third level is, is it too much of a stretch, right? So, all right, you guys. So if you have any questions, you can now bombard me with questions. Oh, oh boy, I should not have said that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. With some of your horses, do you do some form of cross training with them as well? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, so typically our pro do I do any cross, I don't know if you guys could hear that, do I do any cross training with my horses? Yes, I do. So, the typical dress dressage day is like, say, it's roughly half an hour plus, 40 minutes, so there's walking before, then there's the intense work, and then there's cool down. Um, I don't do this every day. Um, after a day off, which is normally, Sundays is my day off, or the horses day off, where uh, usually on the day off they're being either hand walked 
we don't have a hot walker here in California. We have a hot walker, so they go on the hot walker or they go in pasture. Most of my, my stalls have a corral, so they can go in and out. Um, so they, they, they're not stuck in their stalls. Um, so on Monday would be an easy day. An easy day meaning horse is still on the bit. Okay, but it can be anything from a little bit, we can go on a walk sometimes, 45 minutes, half hour. Um, mostly on the bit because I'm a dressage rider. My horses have to be on the bit. They are <laughs> a little bit longer. Some people go, oh man, you have to chill. But <laughs> um, or we take the horses in the arena. We have a l very large arena. So like, like a jumping size uh, court. So we do a two point, basically galloping. If they want to buck, let them buck. Um, my son does that, <laughs> that part. But um, I find that very, very helpful for the horses. Good for their brain, physically good for them. Um, but it's not just madly running around in a gallop. I mean, it's really the horses are over their back. They're using their muscles correctly. Uh, so it is a structured um, goofing off. Um, so my son has a really cool horse um, right now. His name is Aluster. And he warms him up like that almost every day. Um, so he walks and he trots a little bit and then he goes in the canter and then he goes to two point and he does four or five rounds, just two point. And he just hauls ass and that horse is bucking and then he's really loose and then he goes to work. And that's his dressage horse? That's his dressage horse, yeah. His other dressage horse he just jumped the other day. But I mean just a cross rail, you know. So and I find that good for horses. I find trail rides good for horses. I find a little bit jumping. Um, once you get to your Grand Prix horse, that was most likely very expensive, and you're <laughs> stressing, about, uh, stressing out about the health of the, you know, the soundness. Maybe, I don't know, stay away from the jumping. But what about walking over poles or trotting over poles? That I do with all my horses. We throw some poles down and we just trot over it or jump over it, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, your fantastic Grand Prix horse is really good thing it's a good dressage horse, not a jumper because it doesn't know how to jump. <laughs> but it's, it's good, it's a mental break. And it's a good mental break for, for the riders too. And talk about cross training because all of a sudden you use different muscles when you go on a two point. And it hurts. I don't know how the jumpers make it around the course. I mean, it hurts. So, yes. Yeah, go, you had a question, yes. Yeah, my favorite place. Uh huh. And and Nick was running for president. Yep. And all the press was there. All yeah. All the, the international, the national press was there. Yeah. And they had you up against the stone wall. Yeah, I know. You have seen that picture. And yeah. And there was a thousand of us. Uh huh. And you, I, I thought, oh my God, this horse is going to the Olympics, and anything could happen right here. And you were so cool and asking, you know, answering questions. <laughs> I was thinking I want to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that, that thing was, of course, a whole nother experience that, you know, I mean, rather unique uh, to be in, in that position. Because um, you were a spokesman. Yeah, and I, I really didn't want to be a spokesman. <laughs> um, and I remember when, when we kind of started, when this whole thing, when, you know, when Mitt decided that he wanted to go that route, and, and we at the same time decided, you know, it's, you, it looks like we're going to go for it, and it's, it's the horse is doing well, and, and, you know, the sponsors are with us and, and, and are behind us, and, and it, you know, we, we, it might happen, so there might be, and Amy was the, the first one, my wife was the first one that said, you know what, you better be prepared for some media. And I thought, media, me, nobody wants to talk to me. They don't want to talk to Mitt. They don't want to talk to me. Sure enough, you know, all of a sudden it's like you get the, you get the, a, a lot of phone calls that were um, not so pleasant, you know, um, basically just, just um, wanting to. Yeah, yeah, we took that, that bull by the horns and, and just went with it, you know, and um, one of my, my, uh, rider colleagues and, and older uh, rider uh, came a couple of years afterwards came to me and uh, said so you know they really made fun of you 
I said, yeah, but you know, it was cool, it was fine. You know, he said, I did not like that. <laughs> he said, I making my living with horses, and I did not like to make fun of horses. So that was his opinion. I, to be honest, I mean, it was one of those things. It was it was a jab, and um, but you know, yeah, I guess you, it's the way how you how you deal with it. But you were uh, up against a rock and a hard spot. Yeah, and you know, it's so. I mean, we we did. I mean, the team does media training anyway, so we had a lot of media training, and then we did in house in our family. I mean, we had talks about what do you say when people ask, and people wanted to know one thing: how much was Rafaka? That was the one thing that the media kept asking over and over. And I mean, they tried everything, you know? I mean, it's, it's that we arrived in, we arrived in London. Um, so, backtrack. Um, Gladstone was over, um, we made the team. Uh, we had a couple of days where I think Stefan went home. The horses stayed there, Stefan went home, got some stuff. Uh, Tina stayed, I stayed. And we were just, you know, kind of hanging out. Nothing really was, was much going on. And then, you know, I think we had a week. And then we loaded up. So the, I think we were picked up uh, late evening, late, yeah, late evening to go to New York uh, to fly, load the horses, fly over, flew through the night, what, six, seven hours, whatever the flight is, get, arrived in London. Um, and then they drove, the horses were unloaded and they were on that little, Dolly driving all the way around the airport to this hangar where we would unload them, where they would then go on the truck. TV crew was there. And I was the last horse to unload. And uh, Debbie came and Debbie said, Oh, the TV camera is there. I'm like, oh shit, you know, you guys just unload first, you know, maybe they leave. <laughs> so everybody unloaded and they filmed everybody and then finally I came. And um, uh, they, the, the reporter came to me and goes, uh, asked a bunch of questions and uh, she said, well, you know, but, but our viewers really want to know how much did Rafaka cost? <laughs> and I mean, we had practiced this, that and heard that, that now so many times that I said, you know what, um, and it was something along the, the lines, it's like, you know, these horses are really dear to us and, and of course, you know, I mean, we, this was a long trip and, you know, it's, nobody slept and, you know, Rafaka is kind of, she is a very picky eater and she doesn't drink, so what I do is I, uh, I have watermelon. I've cut up watermelon and I just feed her water. And she was like, oh wow, that is such a good idea. So it's like, dodge the question. <laughs> but how, I fell into that trap a couple of times before. I mean, you're driving along and Amy always said, do not answer your phone if you don't know the phone number, of course. You know, me knucklehead, it's like phone rings, like, hello, you know, and then all of a sudden somebody from, from some Dutch newspaper uh, calling, uh, you know, once you're on the phone with them, you can't hang up, you know, and it's like, now you have to answer the question. It's like, oh man. So yeah, there was a lot of stress. But again, um, you know, I just turned off the TV, didn't watch TV, and didn't answer the phone. Um, one day I went down to breakfast, we were in England in our training camp, and um, I came, uh, the whole team was already there, everybody had breakfast and everybody's giggling. And I'm like, what's, what's so funny? Am I like wearing something funny? And they're all giggling and Adrian and Stefan is like, I'm like, guys, what's going on? They're laughing. I'm like, what is going on? So finally Stefan comes over and goes like, it's this thing on his phone where Rafaka was strapped to the plane, <laughs> you know? Because there, there was apparently, it was a, a funny story about, about a dog, you know? <laughs> So Rafaka was strapped to the plane, and we all thought that was very funny. But yeah, no, so I mean, we basically just didn't, didn't really, I didn't watch TV, I tried to just stick to the things that I'm good at. Um, rode and cared about my horse and cared about nothing else but that. And uh, for anyone who wants to know, um, the experience of being on the team is amazing. The experience of going to the, to the Olympics is times a thousand. Um, and it's not just the actual ride, it's just if you walk in the village, it's unbelievable. If you see all these athletes from, from other countries and what they do and everybody's so fit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And then the opening ceremony, holy cow, I mean, that's like really, really cool. <laughs> so go for it. Uh, you know, and I never, I mean, I, I had the dream, of course, but I always thought, well, you know, I mean, it's like, the chances are it's like out of all these riders that want to go there's three or four that make it you know it's like most likely you're not one of them 
So if you hang your hopes on making it, it's probably not a good idea. Just go with the flow and if you make it, great. But if you do make it, it is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So good luck with that. Good luck with, with your horse shows. I think I've, I hope I've answered all your questions. If you have more questions, go for it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. She is doing great. She is um <laughs> Yeah. No, she is actually doing great. She had two babies. One we just started um earlier this year and, and she was too green to bring her along, but so she's back out in pasture. But Rafaka is in pasture with her buddy, her boyfriend Ricardo who was a horse that, that I showed, I think in 98, he was the intermediate uh, champion in Gladstone. And so those two are out in the pasture every day. Um, so she has one filly that is three now, and then she has one filly that's a yearling that is, that I think is gonna be really exciting. So, yeah, but that's, what's her name? Rafaela is the three-year-old. What's, what, Rafaela, yeah, is the three. Aim, help. What's the, what's the baby? Rafaya, right, Rafaya, which clearly wasn't my choice, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I was outvoted. Um, so yeah, no, she is living the, a really a, a great life and, and, and we're so lucky that we can have the horse in a pasture, you know, and because she certainly uh, did a lot for, for me and um, it's just fun for me to see her every day. I mean, she's fat and happy. She's like, you know, her coat is this long right now. And yeah, things are good. But we're, we've decided we're not going to rebreed her. She's just, it's, what is she now, 22, and it's, we're done. Yeah, we're done. She just gets to hang out, eat carrots, and be a horse. So, the, any more questions? We'll take one more. How's that? No more? Yay. It's over. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks.